church. Uh, met a couple visitors today, see other, some other new faces. Glad you've joined us. We hope you're, you enjoy your time here in fellowship and worship together. I mentioned earlier uh, during our class that you might see some slides with a kind of Easter looking theme, but uh, there is no season to God's love for us, amen? And so today we have a communion service, and uh, that's kind of the, the reason for some of the, uh, the theme and the scenery that you see for the Sabbath. Got a couple um, announcements to make. Um, everyone today, by the way, is, join, is welcome to join us for a general church potluck. Uh, even if you did not bring anything, do not worry. There's usually plenty of food. And please consider joining us for lunch uh, right after the service. Um, for those of you, by the way, many of you that I see in here attended Sabbath school this morning, if you have not been attending Sabbath school, I'd like to invite you now to join us each week. We start at 10 a.m. Most of us have to be to work during the week between anywhere from 5 to 8 or maybe 9 a.m. So Sabbath, you get to sleep in. We start 10, sometimes 10.02. <laughs> and we look forward to you joining us this morning. Uh, next week, actually, we're covering horizontal atonement. You're like, well, what does that mean? So we think it says the cross in the church. So when you think of the cross, and you think of the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments deal with our relationship with God, vertical, and the last six deal with our relationship with one another, horizontal. And so this quarter has been going through Ephesians, and today we had a really beautiful lesson. You can study it on your own, uh, you know, you can look through that without going to a class, but I'm always enriched by the participation that takes place in Sabbath school. Um, I enjoy it for that reason, and today uh, we had some wonderful points brought up, so please, if you can, find some energy to, to be up in time and try and be here around 10-ish, and we'd love to see you and love to have you with us and participate. Um, it's a great time, and it's a spiritual blessing as well. We have a first reading for a membership transfer, an incoming transfer, not an outgoing, and this is for Connie Malashenko transferring from the, I think that's supposed to be Chateau, Seventh-day Adventist Church, in Chateau, Montana, to the Meridian Church, right here. Connie is here today. She was one of them participating in our Sabbath school class that I mentioned. And so again, this is the first reading. When we have the second reading is when we carry through the vote. So um, more on that next week. We're holding a back to school event. And for those not familiar, um, that's happening on August 6th. And what it is, is we get lots and lots of donations um, from people all over the community. Many of you uh, bring in clothes and um, all sorts of items that we put out free for anyone who comes and just needs a little extra boost for the coming school season. Some extra school uh, supplies, notebooks, pens, pencils, clothing. Clothing isn't cheap. Families with multiple children, they really appreciate um, the event that we hold that we call the Back to School Community Shoppers Day. Okay? And so this August 6th from 2 to 4 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall, um, is where we'll hold that, and we could use, we usually set up in the morning. So starting, you know, around 9 a.m., 10 a.m., lots of folks that are needed to um, bring out all the totes full of clothes. We lay them out on the tables by age groups, so that's very easy for the shoppers to find something for their child who's, you know, one to three, you know, four to eight, five to 10, I forget all the categories, but we organize them out really nice. Um, we then serve lunch to those who have volunteered and then we get ready for it to start in the afternoon. So uh, if you didn't get a bulletin, they're available out in the foyer, and um, all these announcements that I'm covering, um, the detail is there for you to take a peek at and mark your calendars. Um, so with that, we're also open to donations of school supplies, anything from crayons to pencils, glue, again, notebooks, backpacks, you name it, very, very helpful to the families here in the community. Our next food pantry is this coming Sunday, that's tomorrow from two to three. Volunteers who are signed up, you know who you are. If you're scheduled, we always love seeing you around 20 after 1, 1 1.30, so we can set up shop and get ready for that. Um, let's see, that is not for me. Gem State Academy is having a work bee. That's Sunday, July 30th. If you haven't been able to tell by now, there's lots of activity going around, so if you can't make one, hey, you can participate in another. And so um, they would enjoy your help um, over at Gem State on Sunday, July 30th. Ken, do you want to come on up? Ken's got a, an announcement 
at least one, if not two, to share with us. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I want to promote the uh, upcoming event, the Idaho Conference Prayer Retreat, and that's in November, and I know that's a long ways off, but we want to give you a heads up so you can know about it. There's an early enrollment, and you want to take advantage of that. And what that is, and I had the privilege of going last year, and it was a, it was a wonderful event. It was a nice retreat, an opportunity to just uh, get away and spend some time with the Lord, spend some time with uh, other folks who love the Lord as much as I do, and the fellowship was, was great. The event is November 10th, 11th, and 12th, so you uh, travel there on a Friday afternoon, check in, you have a great meal, and then you have your first uh, presentation that night, something like 7 to 8.30, something like that. And you stay at the um, um, uh, Adventist uh, camp up there in McCall. It's right on the lake. It's Camp uh, Ida Haven. Thank you, thank you. I had a slip there I couldn't remember. And this year it's featuring Rick and, and uh, Cindy Mercer. I don't know too much about them, but if it's anything like last year, it's, it's going to be great and wonderful. So registration is now open, and it runs, uh, early registration runs from uh, now till August 30th, and that's your best opportunity to get the best price. And uh, late registration is as late as October 16th. Um, I would, I would urge you all to consider it and think about it because it's a chance to get away. It's a chance to, to learn about prayer, and, and the venue is wonderful. It's on the lake, and it's a very rustic uh, uh, lodge, very nice, very accommodating. And uh, I never went away hungry. The meals were always great, and, and the fellowship was wonderful. And... Uh, been by that lake at that time of the year was just great. Now I want to talk about something else that we've been doing informally here every Friday night. Uh, we start at 7 and we're usually done by 8.30 and that's Vespers. And what that's about is a, is a little music and prayer. And uh, you're invited to come if you like. Um, Grace has been doing a wonderful job and uh, I personally have learned a lot about prayer. It comes from what Grace has taught me. But uh, we're also going to formalize that, and we're going to pick like one, one day a month to do that. But that's yet to be uh, figured out. And there will be announcements, so watch for it. And when it does happen, please, please come and attend, because it's a wonderful experience. Get you ready for the Sabbath. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ken. Appreciate that. One final announcement is that there's a volleyball camp for fifth to eighth graders. That's also held at Gem State Adventist Academy, July 30th, 30th to August 3. With that, um, it is time where we give back to the Lord in the form of what he has blessed us with monetarily. It's time for where we collect our tithes and offerings and today's loose offering goes to Conference Advance. And those not familiar, Conference Advance predominantly uh, funds Christian, I'm sorry, Adventist Christian education here in the Valley, including Gem State and other schools that we're blessed to have for our children here in the area. So if the deacons will come forward, we'll have a word of prayer for the offering. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for the, the strong Adventist community that we have in the Treasure Valley, the blessing of having a, a family of churches that together have, are able to work together in ministry and um, in foster and support education for our children. Um, we ask for your blessing upon those who are in the schools, the teachers, superintendent, and those families who are sending their children, that they may be blessed by the offerings that are given here today, that the offerings are able to cover all that is needed to keep the strength in educating our young ones. We thank you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
it, all right? If you're, a, if you're a little kid, you can come up to the front. We're going to have a children's story for you. So, who here likes exploring? You like, you like exploring? Who here likes finding treasure? You like finding, have you ever found treasure? No? You found treasure before? That is so cool. I found a butterfly. You found a spider one time? That is treasure, <laughs> indeed. You found some treasure too? Elijah? What's that? A catfish spider? A cat face spider? Oh, well, you better watch out for those cat face spiders, right? They might bite you in meow, right? <laughs> Anyways, okay. So, I want to tell you a story about how I used to try and find treasure. I had this class called Orienteering. Can you say orienteering? Now, do you have any idea what that means? Okay, so, you know when you came to church today, all right, or when you go on a trip with your parents someplace, okay, and you get in the car and you say, give me directions to Krispy Kreme Donuts, right? <laughs> have y'all ever said that at your cars? You wanted to? Oh, okay, now we know. All right. The GPS kind of points you in the right direction. It tells you on this whole journey. It tells you when to make the turn and that type of thing. But when you're orienteering, there's nothing like that. You don't have any Siri, find the golden treasure, okay? Siri doesn't know, all right? And so you have to have a map. You have to have a map, and you have to have some other tools to try and help you to get to where you're supposed to go. What are some tools that you might need? Yes, sir. A paintbrush for mar X marks the spot. That's an idea, okay? A shovel to, when you finally get there to dig it up, right? Okay, what else what might you need? Yes? Who can help her? Yes. A metal detector would definitely help, okay? But if you have a map and it tells, has the X marks the spot already on there and you're all the way over here, how can you get there? How do you know which way is south, north, east, and west? Yes. A compass. You're going to need a compass. So I had this class where we learned how to do that. They gave us all this huge map and all these different numbers on there. Pastor Chris's brother was there, Nick. And uh, this was a great time over there in the mountains, over the, in the Appalachian mountain range. And we had all these things that we had to find, try to dig up and try to locate these numbers and special treasures. And they told us, when you get to this spot... You have to go a certain amount of degrees to the southwest and then go 300 feet that direction, and that's what we had to do. We had to go all the way there, and we had to be sure that we were going in the right direction because there was, we're in the middle of the woods, and so there's no way to kind of guess about it, right? So we had to get there, and then once we got there, we had to look around, maybe sometimes with a metal detector perhaps, search around, and that's when you find the next clue, and then it would tell you, go from this point 500 feet um, at, you know, 20 degrees north or whatever, right? And we had to do that. And we had to do that all the way, all the way to the end. You had five of those points, and the last one is where the treasure was. Come here, Isaac. Okay? The last one is where the, where the treasure was. Now, if you want to get that treasure, how serious are you going to concentrate? A hundred percent, right? You're not just going to be like, you know what? I'm out here in the forest, and I just feel lucky today. Right? I'm just going to walk in any direction that I want to, and then I'm going to stop, and that's where it's going to be, right? If you did that, do you think you'd actually find the treasure? No. No, you wouldn't, right? But what you would you have to do, you have to take each one of those clues and very carefully follow it, use your compass, concentrate, and then go and search for it. And you'd have to be really committed, because sometimes it was hard. We had to climb up mountains and all these various things, right? There was a whole host of it. We had to search with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our body to go and try and find this. And you know what the Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 29? It says in Jeremiah 29, verse 13, it says, And you will seek me, God is saying this, you will seek me. What does it mean to seek me? What does that word seek mean? You will seek means you will find. not find. What's that? Look for or search, right? That's another word, okay? You will seek me and find me 
when you search for me with all of your heart. heart. Okay? Now, when we search for God, what are some, what's our compass with God? What's that? The Bible. The Bible tells us the direction that we need to go. That's exactly right. And we search for it, and we seek, and we dig, and we look for God. And you know what he promises us? Right here, he says in verse 14, I will be found by you, says the Lord. Isn't that a beautiful promise? And so when we search for God and we seek for God and we look for that relationship with him, we do that by reading the Bible and by, what do we do when we're real quiet? And we pray. That's exactly right. When we pray to God and we talk to him and we open up our hearts to him, just like you would talk to your best friend, that's how we search for God with all of our heart. And when we find him, he's such a better treasure than any gold chest that you can imagine, okay? And so let's pray right now, and uh, we can go back to our seats. Dear Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much that you love us and you care for us, and that if we search for you with all of our hearts, you promise that we will find you. And so we ask Jesus that you'd help us as we read the Bible to see all the things that show us your heart and your character. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, so today, hold on, before you go, we usually do, on normal Sabbath mornings, we usually have a children's church. But this morning is going to be a little bit different. It's a little bit more special, okay? We're having communion today, so I want you to hang out with your families. So we'll have a short service, and then we're going to do the communion service all together, okay? So go back to where your parents are, or your grandparents, whoever brought you this morning. And uh, thank you so much for being so cooperative and helping me to find all those good clues. Our first song this morning is Blessed Assurance, page 462. Everybody sing. of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long perfect submission all is at rest I and my Savior am happy and blessed watching and waiting looking above filled with his goodness lost in his love this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. And if you would stay. Stand with us for our opening prayer. Have thine own way, Lord.
And although it's a little warm out, we'll soon be praying it's too cold out. But Father, we're so grateful for your creation, the showing of your love for us, and the, be the beauty that you provide around us. We ask for a special blessing in your warm, strong, loving arms around those who weren't able to worship with us today with their suffering ailments, maybe dealing with things in the family. Whatever it may be, Lord, let them know that you're, th you're there to love and care for them and that they have a family here that also is thinking of them. We thank you, Lord, for those who, despite various challenges, that they power through and help support this church family in administration and physical work and um, all, all the works to support the ministry and having a wonderful place here as a basis for reaching out to this community. We ask now, Lord, for a special understanding to be among us as we proceed through the rest of this worship service where we recognize and bring back to the forefront again uh, the sacrifice that you made for us. We ought to be such a happy and joyous and thankful people for the plan that you made before we even existed to save us all. Now you can't wait to welcome us back into your arms. We thank you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I have a message to y'all. Um, most of you know, um, have seen my granddaughter. She had uh, surgery for her lip Thursday morning in Portland. She's doing great. And she wanted, to, wanted us to tell you all, thank you for your prayers. She's doing fine. And she feels very comfortable here with you guys. Um, some of you that don't know her, she had a huge uh, hemangioma on her lip, and this has been removed, and she is anxious to get back, and she likes being a part of our church. Amen. Yes, thank you, God. Um, is there anybody here that does not know where your deep south Negro spirituals came from, how they came about? Does everybody know how they came about and what they were from and how they were put together? Everybody knows about that? Come on, don't be bashful. Yes, no, maybe. Okay, I will, just in case there's a bashful person out there. Back in the slave days, when they were out in the fields picking cotton, whatever they were doing, they would sing these songs, and they would put them together. And somebody would sing, uh, you know, a verse or a, a rhyme, and then somebody else would join in. And this is how they help themselves get through these days, you know. And so this song that I have, I've had this for 40 years. And I have been looking for the music for 40 years. And a couple of weeks ago, you'll understand um, when you hear the words, it is very poignant for me. Um, most of you know my husband is now, along with Kathy, going through uh, cancer. Um, Bowie has just been through something horrendous. Um, there are probably a lot of you that we don't know have family members, friends that are going through some horrendous health or mental issues, whatever it is. We're all affected because that's just, that's part of being human. And I prayed about it and I said, Lord, I, I just, I need some music. And he provided Elvira. I gave her a copy of a 40-plus-year-old tape that was a copy of a copy, and she pulled it out. So I hope this touches your heart as it does mine. My husband's tired of hearing it, but the words, the words are just, I, I just can't listen to it enough. So here's to you.
I'm gonna tell God all of my troubles when I get home. I'm gonna tell God all of my troubles when I get home. Myself a denials. I'm gonna tell God all my trials when I get home. I'm gonna tell him the road was rocky when I get. That was beautiful. Thank you, ladies. The scripture today is coming from Jeremiah 2.13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. How are y'all doing? Looks like it's going to cool down a little bit for us this week, which will be nice. Just kidding. I don't think so, but wasn't that a beautiful song? Thank you so much for working that out. 
That was very nice. It reminded me of home. I, for those who don't know, I grew up in South Carolina, and um, you know all of that cotton fields, tobacco fields, all of that uh, was part of, well, I heard a lot of uh, Negro spirituals growing up. Um, beautiful songs, a lot of heart. Well, this morning, um, we're going to be having communion, as I told you earlier, and we're going to be, I want to share with you a story of a, a lesson that God gave to me that I thought was impactful to me, and it really made me think a lot, and I want to share it with you this morning as we prepare our hearts for communion. And so, uh, before we begin with uh, this morning's service, I would just invite you to join me for an additional word of prayer as, uh, as we get started. I'm going to kneel here in the front. You're welcome to join me kneeling if you would like, but otherwise, please bow your heads with me. Dear Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for the incredible gift that you've given to us. And so I just want to ask today that you please would send the Holy Spirit to us right now to captivate our hearts and our minds and that this morning we would see you, Jesus, and that our hearts would be won back to you. And I thank you so much for your sacrifice. Please join us here now, and we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So about two weeks ago, some of y'all know, if you've been coming to the Wednesday night Bible study, which I definitely encourage you to come, we have a great time with that. It's Wednesday evenings right here in the Fellowship Hall at 7 o'clock. We're going through uh, the It Is Written Bible study series, and so you don't want to miss that. It's a really good one. But I filled you in a little bit. We've had some projects over at my house, at the G household. Our water main broke. So right where the city's water is, and then it comes off to your house, about six feet off of the, the city's water spot, the water main broke. There was something going on, and my, front, my yard, right beside my neighbor's yard, it turned into a giant hot air balloon filled with water and grass, okay? So you step on that thing, and it would do the wave, okay? It was like there was a serious issue here. And so we went through the diagnostic process of shutting off uh, the irrigation water, hoping it was an easy fix like that, because that, those lines are really, you know, shallow. It wasn't the irrigation water, and so we had the city come out. Both of us turned off all the water in our house, made sure nothing was running, and sure enough, mine was the ticker that was going, okay? My meter was the one that was ticking. So I was like, well, the problem's mine. So start to digging, okay? Started digging and, and searching and trying to find this leak, and as you, as you know, uh, there's no metal detector when it comes to this type of thing, but they do have some x-ray machines uh, that can read where the water's at, and as you might imagine, those things are pretty pricey, right? Looked at some quotes, uh, several thousand dollars, one of them as high as $7,800, other ones lower as 3000 Renting an excavator, I thought about doing that, uh, one of those little small guys, you know, and, and just going to town. But that's still, you know, the, the day rentals, all these various things, I was like, you know what? For that much money, I can dig a hole, right? And so <clears throat> I got my little shovel, and I've got one of those little shovels, you know, like the, the, the garden shovel, you know, it's kind of the narrow guy, right? Um, but he's got a lot of heart, you know, narrow but a lot of heart. So I got that shovel out there, and I started digging. And there were several things that I needed to do to, uh, to, to, to really dig and to find the source of this leak, so here's some lessons that I learned, okay? Well, first off, before I started digging, I had to be honest, and I had to recognize that there was a problem, and the problem was mine, okay? I couldn't blame it on my neighbor. As convenient as that might have been, it was my problem. The water was coming from my side. So I had to dig. I had to start. I had to dig, and I also had to dig deep. These water lines... They bury these things like four or five feet underground, you know, so they don't freeze. It's got to be below the frost line. And so I had to dig really deep. And I had to be patient um, because as I was digging, uh, what I started doing, I found the, like the biggest pimple I could find, you know, in the yard, so to speak, right? The biggest, the, the pinnacle of the water balloon. And I started right there, dug a little hole, took the grass out, and I let it fill with water, which didn't take long. And then I had to watch. I started looking. Where is the stream coming from, right? Where is the fresh water coming from? And I'm going to dig in that direction. And then I'll stop. And then I'll wait for the, see where the, the flow is coming from again. So I had to be very patient. But I also had to be very persistent in following that, okay? 
Um, God, I prayed, you know, Lord, help me to find this thing quickly. And from the hole that I started, I, I made a left or right turn, made like a, like a little L, and I started, ended up about four feet away from where I started and digging, of course, like five feet down until I found the pipe and I found the leak, okay? I had, though, to be persistent. If I would have given up at any point, I wouldn't have been able to find the issue, okay? I wouldn't have been able to find that pure source of that cold water coming from the tap line, okay? And so I had to follow the stream of pure water. And so it was a problem, this water main, it was a real legitimate problem, but it reminded me of a greater problem that we all face, okay? Humanity has faced, the children of Israel has faced, and today you might be feeling like you're facing the exact same thing. So I want to share with you some lessons that as I was sitting there digging this hole and getting on my knees and digging and digging and digging to the point where my neighbor drove by and she said, where's Michael? And she could see my legs like sticking out of the hole because I didn't want to make this giant crater, you know, in my yard. I wanted to keep it nice and narrow like a, like a surgeon was at work here in the yard, which I did. I maintained that, which was, it worked out nice. But I was like head underneath the thing trying to dig and trying to find that, that leak. Of course, I had to widen a little bit to actually fix it. But Still, when I was on my knees, it got me thinking, like, Lord, if you've been trying to get me on my knees, I want to learn this lesson. Because the week before this, I had to fix the garage door opener, right? That thing didn't, it, the, 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 the crank inside sheared off. So there was no repair. I had to replace it. And I had to go in the attic and, you know, frame in a new thing. It was just another project, okay? We mentioned this in our, dis, our uh, New Believers class this morning. There's a difference when you are a, an owner of the house, all right, versus being a renter of the house. If you're a renter and you have a problem at the house, who do you call? The landlord, because at the end of the day, it's whose problem? The landlord's problem, okay? If the water line breaks, you call the landlord. Hey, you have a problem, okay? There's something you should know about, okay? If you're the owner, who do you call? Honey, <laughs> right? Watch out. Okay, or you call someone else and you, you give them lots of money to fix the problem for you, right? But the responsibility is yours. And in the Bible, we're told that we've been bought with a price, correct? We've been purchased with a price, with the blood of Jesus. And so we need to remember to treat our lives as if they belong to Jesus. So when you face problems and trials and uh, tribulations, pick up the phone, the prayer line, and say, Lord, you've got a problem here. Okay, you're opening up your door to your heart at every single turn saying, God, help me out here with this thing, because at the end of the day, I'm yours and you are mine. And so this common problem, though, when we read the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter two, verse 13, it says, for my people have committed how many evils? Two. Now, this is a two sided coin. You can't get one without the other. All right. So. This two-sided coin is what they have put in the, in the slot machine, so to speak, right? And this is what they've got, okay? Two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and at the same time, they have hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can do what? Hold no water. So the children of Israel in this day and age, uh, when Jeremiah here is writing, they had abandoned the covenantal promises of protection that they had with God, Okay? Now remember, the children of Israel, they knew that God was able to do the impossible. I mean, he could split the Red Sea. He could send the plagues to Egypt. He could do incredible things, okay? He could send hornets ahead of them to clear out their enemies. You name it. He's the God of the impossible at the end of the day. But what did they do? They went to go make uh, alliances and agreements and covenants with surrounding nations, Egypt and Syria, Assyria, excuse me. And they were going to try and make some sort of a man-made covenant with another individual to give them assurance of protection. Now, brothers and sisters, we oftentimes do the same thing. Because there are times in our life when you are stressed and you, instead of going to God, you run to something else. Sometimes we, we can escape. Have you ever heard of escapism, right? If Netflix has ever asked you if you're still there, Okay, you know exactly what escapism is, right? Because if you keep it running for too long, they'll just say, are you, are you still watching? Are you still here? Have you died? You know, like, no, I'm still here. I've just, you know, I've given up on life. No. 
We escape to things. We run away from problems and we run into bigger problems. For example, relationship issues, okay? When you have a relationship issue, instead of running to God and talking to Him about it, we run to a friend, perhaps. Or we run into another relationship. Or we run into escapism with entertainment or drugs and alcohol. You name it. Shopping, working, whatever it could be. Going to church and volunteering, even. You can escape into that. At the end of the day, though, brothers and sisters, if we are looking for anything other than Jesus, we are building ourselves a broken cistern. If you are looking for peace, security, joy, fulfillment, happiness, in all the wrong places, you're not going to find those things. What you're going to find is a broken cistern. And you're going to try and fill that thing up, but at the end of the day, it's got a giant crack in it. It can't hold any water. You have to keep on going back to that well of the world to try and fill yourself up. It will never work. You will always be thirsty. You will always be hungry. You will never be satisfied. And so the message given to Jeremiah centers in the fact that you can't find everlasting peace, security, or hope in any man-made construct. You can only find those things in a relationship with Jesus. That's it, bar none, okay? So in Jeremiah 29, we read, and I told the kids this um, a little bit earlier, just highlighted one verse of that. Um, there's this beautiful promise, and this is one to remember, okay? Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14, at least the, the half of 14. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That sounds pretty good, right? Sometimes do you ever feel like God has got his mark on you, right? Well, it's like one thing after another. This promise here refutes that. The devil might be attacking you and trying to blame it on God. Remember, the Lord has got good plans for you. Verse 12. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will do what? I will listen to you. And you will seek me, and you will find me when you search me with half of your heart. Uh, only on uh, one day of the week. Is that what it says? No! Okay, this is a joke, but you know the Seventh-day Adventist, right? Seventh-day Adventist. No, it's not Seventh-day Adventist. It's seven days Adventist, right? Every day. Every day we're staying plugged in. Every day we are connecting with Jesus, okay? Not just one day of the week. Let's keep going. You will seek me and you'll find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. It's a promise that we have from the Lord. He invites, God here is inviting Israel, and today he's inviting you and me to abandon those broken promises and covenants that we have made with the surrounding nations. We need to leave the security of all those sandcastles that we've been trying to hide in. We need to run to the rock, brothers and sisters. We need to run to the shelter that God alone can provide. And in this world, there will be a hundred things to try and fix your problems. Okay? I read this the other day. It was a, a guy who was you know, saying, you know, I've, I've got substance abuse, alcoholism, drugs, that type of thing. And that's my problem. And the counselor, you know what he said? He says, that's not your problem. That's what you're trying to medicate your problem with. So the question is, what is your problem? Like at the end of the day, it's not the drugs or the alcohol or the escapism. That's not your problem. Your problem is that you have abandoned the fountain of living waters. And for the children of Israel, that at the core was their problem. Those other things, they're fruit sins, right? That's the result of the key heart issue is that they have abandoned that sweet, deep relationship with Jesus. And you know what it feels like. Every one of us does, okay? Even in church, when you're doing all the right things, you're saying the right stuff, you're active in ministry, but yet you feel far from God, it's because you've abandoned that simplicity of that relationship. And it's very easy for us to walk from that, okay? Because all it takes is for us to try and find peace or, or, or assurance or self-worth in something else other than Jesus, because if we're getting busy doing good stuff, 
The devil is not going to bother us if our eyes are not fixed on Jesus. He's okay with that. In Haggai, it's not part of the sermon notes, but in Haggai, which I would encourage you to read this afternoon, it's a very similar issue. They were focusing on rebuilding their homes and taking care of their gardens and all these various things, right? While all the while, the temple of the Lord was in ruins. And so God says, consider your ways, go back, work on the basics, and as soon as they got the foundation of the temple built, he's like, from this day forward, I'm going to bless you, okay? I've got your back because now you're putting me first again. That's what we need to constantly remember, to put him first in our life. And so today you might be wondering how exactly we're supposed to do that. Well, in Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, verses uh, 7 and 8, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and it will be opened for you, to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be what? Opened. If you knock on the door looking for God, he promises he's going to open the door. He's not going to send you away empty-handed. He's not going to have a no soliciting sign out there unless you got Girl Scout cookies, okay? You, you're okay. Just go to him. He will open the door. Now, this is beautiful, okay? Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes. Look what verse 6 says, this Beatitude. It says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what? Righteousness, for they shall be what? Filled. It's a promise. If you are hungering and thirsting for the thing that God himself can give to you, the righteousness alone that Christ imparts to us, if that's your, your soul desire, he says, you're going to be filled. You're not going to go away hungry. I've got your back. Okay? There's a meal prepared for you. In fact, I'm going to bring it in. He's like, God is like DoorDash, okay? He comes, he knocks on the door. All you got to do in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, is you open up that door, and what does he do? He comes in, and he sups with you. He eats with you, and he brings the food. Now tell me if that's not a good deal. If you are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, you will be filled. In John chapter 4, we find this really interesting story. Okay? This is, <clears throat> Jesus has got to go. He tells his disciples, guys, I've got to go through Samaria, right? I, I, we're, we're trying to get somewhere else, but I've got to go through Samaria first. Like, it's, like it's, I just have to do it. They didn't quite understand that. That's not quite the safest route. But hey, Jesus is Jesus. Let him take charge here. And so they go. And they stop at this well called Jacob's Well. And uh, Jesus says, you know what? I'm going to hang out right here for a little bit. Why don't you guys go down into town, get some food, and come back, okay? Get some food. I'll stay right here. It's hot in the middle of the day. I'm tired. No problem. So they go down, and then while the disciples are down in the town, <clears throat> Jesus is there, and a woman comes to the well. So this is Matthew chapter 4, 7 through 14. I'm going to highlight one part of it, but this lady comes. She's there to draw water. Jesus asks from her a cup of water, and she's like, Excuse me, sir, but you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. How is this supposed to work, right? Um, how am I supposed to be the one that gives you water? I thought you Jews were better than us, okay? And Jesus said in verse 10, he answered to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now that's got to be intriguing. If you're in the middle of the desert out there, okay, Palestine area is pretty much, it's like this high desert kind of, feels like this a lot. Living water sounds like a pretty good deal, okay? I would be pretty intrigued about that if I was this lady, and she was. And she said to him, sir, you've got nothing to draw with. The well's deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, Whosoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall what? Never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, Bible students, when you see Jesus referring to this water, a fountain springing up into everlasting life, it's got to be a flashback to Jeremiah 2.13. The fountain of living waters. 
This is what Jesus is talking about. I'm going to give you that very thing that the children of Israel have been neglecting and abandoning time and time again. It's me. I'm going to give you something that you need. And if you're hungry and thirsty for it, guess what? I'm going to fill you up. And you'll be able to walk away from here, and you will have a well of that living water with you no matter where you go. This is a beautiful promise that we find here from Jesus. The Desire of Ages, one of my favorite books by Ellen White, um, on page 187, I'm going to read a couple of little passages from this, okay? This is what she says. He who seeks to quench his thirst at the fountains of this world will drink only to thirst again. Everywhere men are unsatisfied, they long for something to supply the need of the soul. Only one, only one can meet that want. The need of the world, the desire of all nations, is Christ. The divine grace which he alone can impart is as living water, purifying, refreshing, and invigorating the soul. Jesus not only, did not only convey the idea that merely one draft of the water of life would suffice the receiver. He who tastes of the love of Christ will continually long for more, but he seeks for nothing else. The riches, honors, the pleasures of the world do not attract him. They con the constant cry from his heart is, more of thee. And he who reveals to the soul its necessity is waiting to satisfy its hunger and thirst. If he's pointing out something in your life, brothers and sisters, he is able also to supply your very need. If Jesus tells you you've got a problem, he's not just like, you know, I don't know, like uh, the homeowners association, right? When they drive by and they say, you've got dandelions in your, your yard. And you're like, well, yeah, I know. It's, it's food for the bees, right? No, they can tell you about the problem, but they never fix the problem. Jesus here will tell you about the problem, and he'll come and fix the problem. Every human resource and the depend and dependence will fail. The cisterns will be emptied. The pools become dry, but our Redeemer is an inexhaustible fountain. We may drink and drink again and ever find a fresh supply. He in whom Christ dwells has within himself the fountain of blessing, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. From this source, he may draw strength and grace sufficient for all of his needs." Today, during our communion service, this is an opportunity, communion serves as an opportunity for us to re-enter into that covenantal promise with the fountain of living waters, Jesus Christ himself. This is a moment for us to say, Lord, I want to accept you as my Lord and my Savior, and I want you to be fully inside of me and my heart and in my mind, and Lord, I want you to change me. I want you to fill me up, and I want you to give me a hunger for the stuff that you can provide. Give me a taste bud for the good stuff. Change my tongue, Lord. I don't want to eat the Krispy Kreme donuts anymore. I don't want to drink the Coca-Cola anymore. Lord, I want to have the broccoli, okay, or the cauliflower, or whatever it is. The thing that you know you should eat, but you don't eat, you ask Jesus to change your taste buds, okay? Psalm 34, 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is he who trusts in him. Today we have the opportunity to taste and see that the Lord is good, to renew the covenantal promise that God has made with us that we read about in Hebrews chapter 8, the new covenant shed in his blood. It's the breaking of the water and the, and, and the drinking of the wine. Breaking of the bread, drinking of the wine, right? There we go. But before we do that, we also practice here uh, foot washing. It's this ordinance of humility, we call it. Right before Jesus uh, gave the, the last supper to his disciples, he did a foot washing service with them. And he commanded them to go and do this every time, okay? And so we do that here. And this is a, if you've never done foot washing before, don't worry, I was there too. I didn't know exactly what it was. If you haven't washed your feet in a while, don't worry. It's okay, you'll get them washed today, all right? But this is what we do. We, we separate into either a family unit, so a husband and wife, kids, things like that. We have a family unit room that's down here on the left-hand side. You'll be directed by the deaconesses and deacons that direction. And if you're here just as a, you know, a man or a woman, then we have um, a, a men's room, and we also have a, a, rim, a women's room, not the restrooms, but two rooms where you can go and do this together. What I encourage you to do as a family or as a friend or you find a stranger you, you haven't met before, to grab them by the arm, go in there, 
pray together, okay, and say, God, I want to thank you for this time. And if you're in a family, perhaps, or a marriage, this is a great time to uh, apologize for something, okay? Every one of us needs that, okay? Um, to pray together, wash your feet, watch the people around you. If you haven't done it before, team up with someone who has. And, uh, and then come back in here, and then we will have the communion service in here. And I'd invite you to sit every other row, okay? Every other row, so that way the, the deacons can come through with the, the bread and the wine, okay? And we also want to remember to keep our conversations to a bare minimum, as this is still part of the worship service. So let's pray, and then I'm going uh, to uh, excuse you to go out, and we'll go to the left down the hall to the various rooms. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I want to thank you that you give us the invitation to come back to you, the fountain of living waters. And as we are so thirsty uh, right now, it's so hot outside, God, there's, there's nothing more that can quench the soul than you. And so I just ask that you please would fill us up, and that as we go into this foot washing part of the service, that you give us a humility in our hearts. And Lord, if there's someone that we need to apologize to, I ask that you would bring that up to our hearts and our minds as well. And we pray this in, our na in your name, Jesus. Amen. few more that are still making their way in. Um, it's very interesting when you think about the Last Supper. Now, the disciples, they had no idea that that was the Last Supper. They didn't realize the, the moment until the moment had passed. But Jesus did something very unique in that situation. You know, during the foot washing uh, ceremony that we practice now, to them it was a common day type of thing. But it was a it was a responsibility and a, a job, we could say, of a servant. And Jesus there at supper, he had laid aside his garments, wrapped a towel around him, and he went and washed each other's, the disciples' feet. And they were astonished that their master, their teacher, would do such a thing for them. What service, what love, what compassion that Jesus would show towards them. And it teaches us the same thing, that we're serving one another. And then after this, after supper, what we read in <coughs> Luke chapter 22, <coughs> excuse me, we read where Jesus gave us the Last Supper. Luke chapter 22. In verse 15 it says, then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until the, it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of, it, of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, Take, this is the body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At this point, I would invite the deaconesses to please come forward. Will the deacons please stand? Let us pray. Father God, I want to thank you so much that you've given Jesus to us to be a sacrifice in our place. And Jesus, we thank you so much for pouring out your life for our redemption. We ask that as we take part in communion this morning, that you would remind us of that beautiful covenant that you have made with us, that you've given as a, the down payment your life, and also the Holy Spirit to us. And so we ask that now our hearts would receive the very gift you want to give to us. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.
Deacons, please pass it forward. We've got one more that is <coughs> searching for the lost sheep of Israel. Would the deacons please come forward? Please be seated. And he took the bread and he gave thanks. And he broke it and he gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Please take and eat now. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Please take and drink this now. Psalm 34, 8, it teaches us to taste and to see that the Lord is good. Blessed is he or she who trusts in him. As we partake in communion, remember, we are inviting Jesus to be in every part of our life, to be a part of every fiber of our being, and to give us strength and energy, substance, and everything else. And so this week, I encourage you that in your prayer time and your devotional time to say, Lord, I want you to be a part of everything that makes me who I am. Make me, Jesus, in your image, and fill me all the way. Let us return in our covenant to the fountain of living waters this week. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for the sacrifice that you've given to us. And we ask that you would become part of everything that makes us who we are. And that Jesus, 
that you would get rid of the old man and the old woman and that you would stand perfectly within our hearts and our minds. And I ask Jesus that you would transform us by the renewing of our minds, by spending time with you in prayer and through Bible study, and that you would prepare us for the day when we will do this with you in your kingdom. And so we ask this, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Our closing song now, we will turn to something. Please stand for our closing prayer, or closing song. Uh, yeah, I guess it is our closing song. Sorry. As well, next Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, we have Revelation 2.0, diving deep into the Bible. Invite everyone out to come for that one as well. Let us pray, and I invite you again to make a right-hand turn and come into the fellowship hall for our meal afterwards. Father God, I want to thank you so much for the blessed assurance that you've given to us, that no matter where we go, no matter how hard the day, you will be with us. And that, Jesus, as we search and we seek for you, as we open up our hearts and we say, Lord, I'm coming home, you're ready. You're looking, you're waiting for us. And that you're going to prepare a meal that we do not have to make. We just simply have to open the door of our hearts. So we ask Jesus that this week you would encourage each and every one of us as we make that return to dive deep into the fountain of living waters, to drink deep at your, well, your water source, to fill us up. For we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.